Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Hello, wonderful. This is Sarah. And have you ever had a past or known someone of the past that you just thought, oh my gosh, like, where do you go from here? I've experienced so much hurt. I've experienced so much pain. I've had so many people let me down. Uh, is this what life is? Can it be better? Uh, can it get any better? And that is why we have today's guest, uh, Marcy Hopkins of Wake Up With Marcy. She is an award-winning TV personality, host, and a recovery expert, as well as the author of Chaos to Clarity. And one of the things I loved when I studied her work is the idea of going from victim to survivor, to living a life of your wildest dreams. So hello, Marcy, and welcome. So wonderful to be here. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, and so why don't you kind of, my philosophy is always get past the past, real about the present and serious about the future. But um, I know our listeners would love some type of info on, on what you have overcome. Do you want to give mm -hmm. us a quick snapshot into your childhood? Yeah, so I experienced physical, mental, sexual abuse uh, in my youth. My mother and father were both alcoholics. I was moved around a lot between my grandparents and my mom. I also had to take on the role uh, of mother at, at my senior year of high school because of my mother's addiction. And so I had a, a lot of trauma and I had to find ways to cope myself, which were negative ways of coping, um, just to survive in, in the circumstance that I was in. Um, so when I say negative coping mechanisms, I turned to alcohol myself. And also I took on a victim mindset. And so that affected me and my relationships throughout my life until I put down the drink. And the victim mindset is such an important conversation because mm -hmm. when people read your book, Chaos to Clarity, you were a victim. Mm -hmm. I, right? Like there's things that have actually happened to us that, you know, when you write you the story, you go, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so what do you see the difference in people who've been through this type of pain and some of them kind of remain in that victimhood and some of them move past it? Yes. Yeah, so really you are a victim and it is a way that you learn to cope and survive with what is happening. So what happens is you're losing self-esteem. You begin to blame everyone around you for anything that is happening negative, negatively in your life. You don't think that you are able to have a good life. You live in fear to move forward with anything you become very defensive. You know, there's many ways that we begin to act in these negative ways just to survive, like I've said, but then it becomes detrimental to our lives as we get older. And really that affected my relationships, my ability to be happy with myself, happy with others. So it really became pretty toxic for me. And it's so hurtful you know when we talk about turning to alcohol or something like that yeah when you've been through something there's so much pain attached to it mm -hmm. it's there's a it's really difficult when you I know in your book when you talked about kind of sitting with your emotions and not turning to a drink how exhausting it was right yes and there's yeah. a reason we avoid this stuff right mm -hmm. it's not easy mm. no no so yeah, I mean, listen, I found alcohol when I was about 12 years old. My mother was marrying my stepfather. We had a small wedding at my grandmother's house. There was champagne there. And I was just like immersed in it. And I started drinking champagne and they had to put me to bed because I had drank too much. But wow, I was happy. I was, you know, I, I just felt like it was an escape. And I held on to that. Um, past that one episode. And then as I got older, you know, I just kept drinking more and more. And I also saw my mother drink every day. I saw my grandfather drink every day. Uh, so drinking in my life was very normal. I mean, my, I can just remember when I was eight years old, 
I had a stomach ache. My mom said, here, drink some of my margarita. You know, my, that helps me when my, st- when I can't go to the bathroom, you know, like it's just, you're taught as a young person, like your answer is alcohol. Mm-hmm. And so what was your wake up call for putting it into your toxic relationship with alcohol? Oh God. Well, my whole life was falling apart around me. I'll tell you that. Um, and, and that's one of the, I, I, I just want to say that if you are starting to notice that your relationships are in trouble, your job is in trouble, you don't want to get up. All you think about is alcohol, you know, who you're going to go to lunch with and have wine with or whatever. Um, you know, that's when we really need to take notice that alcohol is a problem. And for me, my drinking really elevated when I got in front of the camera because I had no self-esteem at all. And yet I put myself in a position to be judged all the time. And I was so nervous all the time. So I started drinking. I called it my liquid courage. So my drinking began to elevate. I also became that victim mentality that, you know, I got to stay home with my kids, but how am I, you know, going to move forward with this career that I was after this, this childhood dream, because I wanted to be a model. And when I was 16, so this was something I was going after when I was, you know, early, early forties. So it just really got to a place where if I didn't put down the drink, I was going to lose everything and continue my negative relationship cycles. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, So, yeah. What has changed in your life since uh, moving on from alcohol? Well, I want to tell you the first moment that I surrendered, admitted that I was an alcoholic and my husband embraced me. It was the first time I felt love in my life that I truly felt that a man loved me, what, what it really meant. So that was, first of all, for me, a huge change. When I went into the 12 step program, I went in with shame and guilt and fear But as I started working on the steps and working on myself, um, I began to shift with faith and spirituality, um, giving myself time and being, um, allowing myself uh, the time to be present with myself and heal from my pain. I recognized my role in things. That was a huge one for me because in those steps, you start writing down how everyone has wronged you. This is a big thing about victim mentality also. You don't see your part in it. You don't have empathy for the other person because you don't see their position in anything. I started to see that. And that's when things started to really shift for me. And then I understood that I have control only on my, about myself how I react to things, how I take things in and process them and and just giving myself the space to do that and say, I'm not wrong for having a part in it, but as long as I can deal with my part, understand the other person's part, you can come together and actually have communication about it and move on from it instead of blowing up and, you know, you know, we all say thing and do and do things when we're really upset. And, and I did that quite frequently. So I've learned to have that pause button and that's really helped me too. So there's so many things that I've learned, but. Well, there are so, and I hear you talking about a both and statement. And I think this is really important for our, for our listeners, because the people who are listening to this podcast, they have had people really treat them in ways that were unhealthy in ways that were hurtful in ways that were what I consider wrong what many people in society would consider wrong um you know and it's a both and conversation of both acknowledging the true hurt Mm -hmm. that they experienced and get past the past real about the present and serious about the future you know real about the present and that hurt but then also serious about the future which Maybe the people in your life will say they're sorry. Maybe they won't. Maybe yeah. you'll get closure. Maybe you won't. But but we yeah. have to figure out how to move on either way. 
Yeah, I think as we heal and get stronger ourselves and we are able to realize we are deserving mm -hmm. of love, self-love, of respect and, and how people treat us, that we start standing up for ourselves more. And maybe the person that's in your life isn't the right person in your life, whether it's a friend whether it's someone at work, whether it's a partner, right? Mm -hmm. But as we start healing, we're able to actually answer those questions in a better way than if we are doing it from a place of hurt or trauma or brokenness. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, you really, it, once you start doing that, I've realized I cut people out of my life now. If they are not lifting me up, uh, because I don't have, I don't have the room for it. And I don't need to have that in my life. I did a live today on the importance of not wearing trauma on your t-shirt. Uh, and I see some people go in and it's like, and it's, we're in a place in society, right? So when you were growing up and when I was growing up, it was a shh, like yes. if something bad happened, it was a shh. Yeah. And I want to point that out because that was the way society was. It wasn't mm -hmm our parents that yeah. were that way. That was kind of the society that they were in. And now we've done a bit of this pendulum swing to like, wow, ah, you know, here's yeah. my life and kind of spill it out. Um, which I think I'm hoping that we, we find a healthy balance yeah. um, in that, but the swing is needed. Mm -hmm. I right? agree. Because yeah. Just like in setting boundaries, if you've been a doormat and then you swing to start setting boundaries, you might come across a little more bitchy at sometimes than you would like because you're learning. You're like a little toddler. Yeah, exactly. What? It's true. We are changing. Again, it's that shift in mindset. And, and I love that at least we are talking about that and understanding that. And it's like, there's not anything wrong with you um, mm -hmm. as far as, you know, you're not alone in this. We are all learning to shift our mindset. And if there is trauma, I mean, that is deep in our DNA. I mean, we have to change our, our, our brains, our bodies, our souls. I mean, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I used to have to, my grandfather, you know, don't you ever share about your mom, you know, don't ever share about this. Right. And now it is hard to share um, at times. And people are always saying, oh, you're so brave. You're so brave. But I share hopefully in a way that allows someone else to know it's okay. Because I have people share with me things that they have never shared with anyone. And I will say to them, this is the start of your healing journey. Once you say it out loud, you have begun. And it is okay to talk about it. You don't have to talk about it to everyone. Maybe it's a therapist, you know, whoever it may be. But as long as you are letting that out, and, and dealing with it, I think there's some real uh, shifts for somebody. Um, and you got to do these mindset changes and it's work every day. So in your mindset changes to embrace self-love and yeah. learning of yourself, what are some things you did? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I want to tell you that the first thing, um, well, I turned myself over to my higher power. I think it's so important that we have some sort of understanding of a higher power in our lives. Secondly, gratitude, living in gratitude, because <clears throat> I lived in such a negative state. I was constantly complaining. I don't care what you saw from the outside, how good it looked. I found everything wrong with it, right? So once I started finding something each day, two to three things, I would write down these things that I was grateful for and I would put them in a gratitude jar. And so I started shifting from that negative mindset to a positive mindset. So instead of complaining, I was looking for things that I was grateful for. Meditation, huge, right? That's not necessarily just sitting there, quieting your mind. That is something in time. Meditation is something you build on. I actually started with a lot of healing meditations on YouTube. There is a meditation for everything. There is one five minutes. There's one 
you know, 12 hours, you know, so it just depends on what you're ready for, what you're looking for. I still listen and listen to healing meditations uh, every night because it's an ongoing process. You don't just one day say, okay, I'm all good. No, it's something that continues. Um, but the, you know, those were two huge ones. Again, like I said, uh, faith, higher power. So spirituality became huge for me. And also the art of allowing, law of attraction, manifestation. Those were big ones for me too. In the conversation about the gratitude journal, it's yeah. hard to find any person in any type of healing or mindset work that doesn't talk about gratitude. And yeah. there's a fabulous book called Buddha's Brain, which is not about Buddhism necessarily, but he yeah. used this example of a island and you see beautiful flowers and you see an ocean and yeah. you see you know all these beautiful things. And then you see a crocodile. Well, what is your brain going to focus on? Yeah. The crocodile, because you're trying yep. to stay alive. And yeah. So in many ways, our brains are made to keep us alive, Yep. to make us happy, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's something I want to point out to our listeners, because you were talking about, you know, not being broken, not being, uh, you know, this messed up thing. And it's like, yeah, if your brain has a hard time shifting to see the flowers and the beach and the white sand and yeah. not mess over the crocodile, that is your brain's way of keeping you alive. Yeah, the fight or flight. Yes. And yeah, that's so many of us live in that. But just an example, we can go all day, right? We mm -hmm. can get 15 compliments. One person says something negative, And what do we do? We just reel on it. We keep thinking really? about it, keep thinking about it. Yeah. Yes. And it's really sad that that for whatever reason, that's the one thing we focus on. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, I've had really just like one negative comment, all the stuff I've had out there, just this one. And it was somebody, I was interviewing an author that I had been really excited to interview. And the person in the people in the comment chat were so offended that I seemed so happy. It was a very serious topic, but I'm oh. happy. Like, this is how I, this is how I act. This is my face. Yeah. You yeah. know, and it was really interesting, you know, kind of how I've had to move away from that because they were like oh is she nervous is she laughing or smiling because she's nervous and it was like what? oh no. no like no this is just like <laughs> you want me to be sad that make the interview better for you if I was more sad you know anyway the the author who I had just loved loved the interview so much it's on the front page of his website and yeah the great people that I don't know thought I smiled too much you know and it's just so silly the way our yeah but you know what I think what makes me sad is that person is probably sad, oh, absolutely. right? Yes. So we have all these comments and people saying things and people doing things, but they're broken too. And they really, a lot of times I just look at people and I'm like, I'm sad for you. I'm sad for you because you are in, obviously in so much pain, you're living in hate and negativity. And we really all do have an opportunity to change just unfortunately, the majority don't. It's hard work. It is hard work. Mm -hmm. and, and in your work of, of really thriving of that life of your wildest dreams, yeah. I think it was almost like those little, you know, those old jello things we had when we were little. And it was like you'd have these layers of jello, like yeah. A, a yeah. white chocolate, a light chocolate, and then a dark chocolate layer of pudding. Um, and those really are distinct levels. So yes. a lot of people get stuck in the victim mindset. Yeah. And then some people get stuck in the survivor mindset, which is like where I said, they kind of wear trauma on their t-shirt as if yeah. the most interesting thing that happened to them is surviving a toxic relationship. But it's like, but that's still about the toxic relationship. That's yeah. not just, you're given the power there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so how, mm -hmm. how do you make that, sh that next level shift and what advice would you have on helping others do so? Well, so that first year of healing, and it, in my book, I, I talk about the 12 steps of AA and what happened for me during those steps. And I will say, I don't care if you have a trouble with drinking or a substance, those 12 steps are miracle workers. So if you get my book, Chaos to Clarity, take a look at it. I share with you what happened for me. But and I, and I invite everyone to do it. 
But as I started moving through those steps, it started healing. I started seeing signs. So my book, Signs from the Other Side, right? Seeing signs and breaking the cycles. So seeing the signs is negativity in your life, negative patterns, generational cycles, but it's also seeing signs from the other side, right? You I had a rose signs, right? I, Did you find that involved roses? Right. So like the first small one, but really big, because it just shows you that we have these little signs all around us. But someone had told me that the Virgin Mary was trying to get messages to me and for me to look for red roses, right? So I'm thinking to myself, I'm out, we've gone on a trip and I'm out in the middle of the ocean, basically. And I'm thinking to myself, where am I going to see a red rose? Where is a red rose? And then I look down and the bag that I was holding had a woman holding red roses. And basically, um, I think it said, love the person you are or something like that. And so that's when I was starting to build on self-love. It was a sign uh, for the roses were there. And then they just got bigger and bigger. So I started seeing signs from the other side. I started getting a lot of nudges um, from my intuition, from my inside, my inner self. I did a lot of child, uh, inner child work. I still do that. Um, and but what really helped me is when I found Abraham Hicks, and. I started learning the practices of living in joy and living in peace and feeling the feeling of something good happening. And then it actually happens. So that is what started happening for me. And I just kept growing on it. And that is so hard. I mean, she mm -hmm. said, said like five words and it's like, you know, packed into this thing. But, but I want to say that, that personally was one of the things I really struggled with in coming out of my own pain is that practicing the feeling mm -hmm. before the outcome happens. That was so yeah. hard for me. It is hard. And let me tell you, I'm six and a half years sober. And now, I mean, I'm so much stronger in that area it takes a long time. And that's what we got to give ourselves is patience. My God, me, I mean, I was in my late forties when I started healing and, and, and how long had I been in pain? So right now I'm like six and a half years in of healing and I got, a, I still got a lot of work to do and I'm and glad I have every day. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about your, the exhaustion of this process. Yes. And I want to link that a tiny bit to where you said you were able to listen to your intuition yes. because someone is listening to this and they have pain and it's like, well, let me drink, let me Netflix, let me social media, let yes. me set, let me whatever to avoid those, those feelings. Um, if you want to get to the intuition side, you yes. kind of have to go through that getting quiet and yeah, really you do. You got to like release that craziness in the head. So that first year of healing, I took a nap every day because really, if you think about it, and I spoke about this on a cellular level, my body was changing, right? So my body, my mind, everything about me was exhausted daily. And like I said, I started uh, doing the YouTube videos for uh, meditation. Um, I, I did meditation to connect with God. Um, I did meditation to uh, release past trauma. I did uh, meditation to receive messages from my angels. You know, all of these things were very important to me because I saw them happening. So I wanted to build on that, um, build my strength in that area. So I kept doing that. And then my intuition became stronger and stronger. So when someone talks about intuition, I think sometimes people don't even understand what that is, right? Mm -hmm. But those are those really strong feelings about something, whether you should do something, whether you shouldn't do something, whether you should move forward with something, whether someone comes in the room and you don't feel right about them, that's your intuition talking to you. And it's really important that we listen to it. I have talked to so many women, obviously, about toxic relationships, and they yeah. say, oh, I ignored the red flags, or I didn't see the red flags, and I say, did you not see them? 
<laughs> talk yourself out of them, you know, because, you know, I, I have a 13 year old guru test and it's like, let's line up 13 year old girls, right? And we'll use the example right. you talked about drinking at 12 and yeah. your parents let you get like drunk because you talked about actually being drunk at 12. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's, let's ask a bunch of middle schoolers. Do we think that's a good parenting move? Maybe not so good parenting move, right? These right. middle schoolers are going to say, oh, that's cool, maybe, but but they're, they're going to know, right? And I think that intuition is some of this like simple process of like, mm-hmm. oh, no, that wasn't a good idea. We know that we should yeah. listen. To I people. just wanted someone in my life. That's why I stayed in negative relationships. Uh, and but I also was always defensive I was always yelling that's what I was raised in also I saw yelling every day so you you just blew up and then you would just sweep it under the carpet and then act like it never happened so I never even learned how to communicate these are all things we're learning as we're growing up so as we become teens and adults like I don't want to say it's like it's it's just it's learned behaviors yeah, we have to break those. And as a society, we're going through such a culture change of family dynamics, you know, even with religious communities. Uh-huh. Yeah. Year, there was such protection in certain religious communities of, you know, pe- hiding sin, I guess, in the context of religious communities, you know, and now it's like yeah. you can listen to a podcast about this group falling apart or this church falling apart, you know, and so as a society, we really are in a, those little wind up toys, you wind it up, it's a, yeah, <laughs> a right, project. yeah, yeah, the clown comes out, yeah, we're a yeah. little bit in the stage of like, the, the jack is popping out, the clown is popping exactly. out, exactly, but there's some beauty to that, mm-hmm. it is, you know, I think that I, okay, so me personally, I feel that I am now attracting what I am putting out. And that's goodness. When I was sick, I was attracting what I was putting out, right? So now that we are able maybe to start learning more, like think about who you're surrounding yourself with because then maybe you can shift how you are, what you are learning, how you are acting. Because if you, I, I tend to now have people that are like-minded that I've, I've, I've learned to, to think a certain way and live in this happiness. And that's what I surround myself with. And when I was drinking to excess and bitching and complaining all the time, That's who I had in my life. You know, we're constantly on the phone and we're just negativity constantly, right? Like who had the worst story, you know? And then you just say it over and over repetitively, right? Yes. And I want to say there's people who talk about their problems and people looking to solve their problems. And I, you know, because I, there may be some women, I know that there are some women right now that mean, well, how do you have friendships without, oh, you won't believe what happened to me. And that is almost this like weird girl code. Guys don't do it typically yeah. as much. There's this right. weird negative culture with females that it's like, who's the most tired? Who's yeah. the kids, who's doing the most for their kids and sacrificing the most? You know, this real martyr, it can yeah. be martyr hood, but martyr just femalehood that uh, I yeah. can tell. And listen, we're all, we all need to vent a little bit, right? But <laughs> it's just, if, if you're staying stuck in that, Sure. Um, yeah. And I think talking about a martyr, talking about motherhood, we can lose ourselves and we don't allow ourselves the time for self-care or things that we care about or things that we enjoy. I today do things that I enjoy. I used to not do them and resented everyone around me. All right. So we have choices. We really do have a choice whether we are moving forward in an area that we would like to, you know, maybe it's a hobby. Maybe you enjoy cooking, you know, whatever it may be, you can make, take that passion and fill yourself up. May not be what you do in it all the time, but you can allow yourself that time. And self-care is a hundred percent what we must all do. I always like to go back to that oxygen mask. I think we're all kind of go to that, uh, I love that term, you know, you got to put your oxygen mask on first 
to allow those around you to, to heal and be happy. Because if you're not alive, nobody around you is like feeling alive. One of the best lessons I learned from this is a friend I have who never exercises. Like she's always like, Sarah, why, why do you exercise? And I, I've not been known to eat healthy all the time, but I have been a good exerciser. And um, yeah. she says, why do you exercise? I said, everybody in my life exercises. My uncle ran the Boston Marathon. My other uncle's a kind of a weightlifter. My dad plays competitive tennis in his sixties. Like everybody and in, in my mother walks and bikes and, you know, yeah. it's like everybody in my life exercises. And she said, yeah wow, that was such a gift to you that you grew up with that being normalized with, you know, Mm -hmm. because I don't think, am I going to exercise this week? I think, when am I going to exercise this week? Um, And that conversation with her really shifted my parenting because I thought, okay, what do I want to be easy for my kids? Right? Mm -hmm. I want Mm self-care to be easy for my kids. I want priority sleep and rest for me and for them to be a priority to be normalized for my kids. I want a peaceful relationship to be normalized for my kids. And, mm-hmm. and when, when we always put ourselves last or, or get into that role of martyrhood, um, I think our kids can see some inconsistencies of that, right? It's like, you're, well, telling, yeah. me you're, not. you're telling me yeah. to take care of myself, but you're not, right? Right. But it, I don't know about you, but I would explode. I'd lash out. Like it was, yeah. Right. I, it wasn't good because I was always feeling everyone else gets, but I get nothing except for what I'm giving to you. And there's part of that is that, that victim mentality. I was trying to overcompensate for my children because my, my parents weren't there, you know, so I never wanted my children to feel abandoned. I never wanted them to want anything. I, you know, I wanted to give, 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 but that depleted me. And so Mm -hmm. I will tell you, like, I allow myself at least 30 minutes of whether it's meditation or close my eyes every day to reboot. And it's so important. Two shifts in the day. (laughs) I rebooted right before our call. I did. Like, (laughs) I've already talked because I had like three interviews this morning. It's been a past yeah. day. And then it's like, oh, okay, I need a rest. I need a reset. So yeah. uh, the people, you know, at the end of our day deserve the, the freshness at the beginning of our day, even if the people is us, <laughs> even yeah. if the, yeah. the refreshing is us. Oh, I, but sometimes great. like you think about it, like if we feel guilty because we lay down, well, are you a better person because you didn't lay down? Are you, you're multitasking. Are you really doing each one of those things good, right? Like, so it's really not about doing, it's what you're doing well. Yes, yes. And I know in living the life of your wildest dreams, you have done plenty of things well. (laughs) Why don't you brag on yourself just a bit and tell us where we can be a part of all the great things you have going on? I just want to tell everyone out there that I was a broken woman that went after something that broke me more. And that what I mean by that is getting in front of the camera. I've always worked in television, but once I got in front of the camera, I, I deteriorated because of my fear and because of my brokenness. But once I put down that drink and I started allowing the intuition and my nudges from the other side to come through, that is where I got the motivation and the idea to do a talk show which started out as a social media talk show. Now I am an award-winning talk show host. I just won a telly award for my show. I I am on CBS own network on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. WLNY TV. I have just launched into other markets in California in Idaho Falls. I just wrote a book that I've just launched and I just am coming out with my invention that I had in my head from 14 years ago. So it's never too late. But all of these incredible things that continue to happen in my life are not because, you know, I'm doing anything fantastic. I am doing uh, the work every day. I am believing in myself. 
I have turned myself over to my higher power. I don't, I don't second guess myself. I, I, I really, I know that every day I am being guided. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one more story that is in my book. And when I said, finally, after all the nudges from God and from, you, you get them on the TV, you get them on the radio, right? You get them through podcasts, you get them through friends saying things. So finally, I gave in and sat, walked outside and I said, okay, God, I will write this book, okay? And a rainbow appeared. There was no rain. It had not just ended raining. Literally, there was a rainbow. I had two doves, which represent love, come oh. and they were on top of my roof and a dragonfly flew by me, which as you can see, I wear a dragonfly. It's in my logo. It's on my book cover. It means transformation. I had a beautiful God story about you know my dragonflies. But that's what I'm just saying. Release yourself to those nudges, to your intuition, because you are being guided. Everyone is being guided. If we just allow ourselves to listen and see it, to live our happiest lives. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a purpose. This is my purpose. No one should ever you know, want my purpose. Go after your purpose and you will find your happiness. Oh, you guys check out Marcy Hawkins at Wake Up With Marcy and then her book, Chaos to Clarity. And Marcy, thank you so much for helping us on our journey to becoming toxic person proof. Thank you.